Dave Hare, uh, I'm going to present sort of the second half of our SMC education. I'll start off with a quick summary of what SMCR is that sort of summarizes Jerry's presentation from last quarter. And we'll get into some of the configuration necessary, some of the steps, not a lot, and then uh, some of the monitoring that we've added, which is a lot, and a little bit of diagnosis towards the end. So a quick summary, a reminder of what SMCR is. I figure I start with a picture. That's the easiest way to indicate uh, what we're doing, and we'll get into a little bit more of a description. And what this picture is showing is um, an SMC connection. And what an SMC connection for us is, is kind of a hybrid between a TCP connection and a SMC connection over the uh, Rocky network. And the way we do that is we establish the TCP connection first, just like we do any other TCP connection, exchanging a new option that sort of indicates our interest in using SMC for this TCP connection. So that all flows over the TCP network. After that exchange completes, that's our normal three-way TCP establishment handshake. Uh, if both sides have agreed to use SMC by the exchange of the TCP option, uh, we, we do a three-way handshake over the TCP connection once again, but this time we're passing data back and forth. And the data passed back and forth uh, indicates information on each side's um, rocky connection, so that we're establishing this, this, this kind of rocky connection that, that is equivalent of two pairs connecting together. So when that completes, we then transition to out-of-band, and all subsequent data, which is all the application data, starts to flow over the actual SMC link at this point. We're now using the rocky network. And it's at that point that there's really no going back. Once we start exchanging application data over the SMC link, we're committed to that link and you cannot fall back to TCP. The TCP connection remains active and will be used during the termination of the connection and any control information like keep alive and things like that. We'll discuss that later. But So you basically have both connections up at this point, all data flowing over the SMC link. And you can see from the picture here that I indicated the new SMC layer in the stack and the RMBE, that's that buffer that Jerry mentioned last presentation that the data is actually written into. That's the registered data. Each side registers to the other side. And then we write into that buffer directly. That's the Rocky protocol. The application data indicated by the yellow line then gets written into that RMBE. All right, so RDMA, this is the general RDMA, not necessarily our implementation. The next slide will discuss what we implemented from RDMA. But RDMA itself enables a host to read or write directly into or from a remote partner's memory. And you don't have to involve the host CPU. It's sort of a silent write into it or read from it. <clears throat> and the way they do that is they register that memory that I mentioned on the previous slide, the RMBE element, for the partner to use. You still require an interrupt. If I write into the partner's uh, buffer, I still have to notify him that there's data there for him to receive. So there still requires an interrupt, so there's, there's some CPU cycles for that. However, the overall networking stack overhead is greatly streamlined using the RDMA interfaces. All right, so the key requirements is it requires a, a lossless network fabric, layer two, um, and you need the RDMA-capable RNIC, or the Rocky Express adapter, and a RDMA-capable switch, which is it was just, just, just another 10 gig Ethernet switch. It's nothing fancy. All right, so comm server's solution for RDMA, we call it SMCR, Shared Memory Communications over RDMA. <clears throat> this allows our TCP socket applications to transparently exploit the RDMA network. And as I mentioned before, it's a hybrid solution. We use the TCP connection to set it up, and then each side exchanges the options to indicate their interest in using SMCR. And then we have the three-way exchange after that that we call a rendezvous, where we exchange uh, some messages back and forth across the TCP connection, uh, indicating information about our SMC link. And when all that's complete, we then uh, transition to the out-of-band and we start exchanging socket application data over the RDMA connection. The TCP connection remains active, and that allows us to preserve a lot of our uh, uh, quality of service operations today during connection setup, we can still do intrusion detection and things like that. So by maintaining both connections, we uh, get to exploit a lot of the stuff that TCP currently supports. 
All right, so that's a quick summary. I've included a reference chart uh, for, for everybody's use that has a lot of good information depending on the topic you might be interested in. The two, the two uh, presentations that Jerry and I gave are the top. The overview that Jerry gave is listed there. Uh, this is the um, operations monitoring is the second one there. There's a fact that we created. There's a performance uh, presentation out there that has a lot of the information on the performance of, of SMCR. Uh, we have the RFC itself. And uh, we also have a recently developed security white paper that talks about security in SMCR. So some good information out there with that. All right, so let's get into configuring and monitoring uh, your SMCR connections. We'll start off with uh, the configuration first, some of the system requirements, things that you have to code on the TCP IP profile. And again, I'll, uh, I'll tell you there's not a lot to it. It's, it's a very simple configuration. And then some of our NetStat reporting and TCP IP display changes. Some of the VTAM commands that also allow you to, to monitor the network. And uh, some SMF enhancements. I've also included an appendix at the end of this that goes into more detail on, uh, for instance, our NMI enhancements. But since they mirror NetStat and SMF, I, I'm not going to cover them today, but they're in the appendix for everybody's uh, use. All right, so before using SMCR, you must take the following actions you must code your new Rocky adapter cards. Uh, and, and that's what we call the PFID. You, you, for redundancy, we recommend you configure two per physical network or two per stack. Uh, they will be assigned a physical network ID, and that's a requirement for your RNIC interfaces. You also must code a physical network ID for any OSD devices or your OSAs that will be associated with these RNICs. <clears throat> and we'll get into a lot of this when we get to the configuration. But essentially, this allows us to tie specific Rocky Express cards or your RNIC cards with the OSAs that they will go over, okay, that you'll use to establish the connection. And we don't require a separate definition of the Rocky Express cards in the stack. And you'll see that when we get to the configuration. We use the OSA configuration to sort of dynamically start and activate the Rocky Express adapter cards. But you do have to set up in the hardware configuration definition the physical network IDs that allow us to tie these Rocky Express cards with the OSA cards. And then you need to configure your Ethernet switches appropriately. Uh, if you de decide to use the optional VLAN values for your OSA, which will then be inherited by the Rocky cards, you would have to also enable that on the Ethernet switch. And also we recommend that you use the flow control capability, the ability to sort of stop if necessary the transition, the, tra the, the data. All right, so what I have is some screenshots that we took from our shop here, uh, going through the hardware configuration definition. And in this case, I'm going to add a new Rocky car. And it just gives you an, uh, an idea. This isn't the comprehensive, all the, all the HDD panels, but an idea of what it would be like to add a new Rocky card to your, uh, to your system. So from the HCD main panel, I selected option one. This is in the blue box in the upper right corner. I'm on page 11. And then from there, I selected three, the processor list, and then select processor. And I get the following menu. And when I'm on the following menu, I choose option eight, work with functions. I hit enter, and we go to the next page. And you can see here, I already had some Rocky Express adapters defined. I had eight of them listed on the left with the PFID IDs, one through eight. Now, later when we get to the TCP stack configuration, you'll see how those PFID IDs correlate to the part that you have to configure for the TCP stack. So keep in mind, just remember those one through eight, those PFIDs there. Uh, the other thing is the PCHID tells you what, what PCHID value it has, and then of course the type is a Rocky Express adapter. In this case, I'm gonna add a ninth one. So I select A next to any of the eight there to get to the next panel. You can see on the bottom, A, and then I hit PF11. So here I'm adding a ninth um, Rocky Express card. I say it's a Rocky card. I would put in the PFID I want. I think it can go up to as high as 255. And uh, again, we already used one through eight, so I would likely just select number nine here. Add that in here, very simple. And then again, whatever I add here is gonna go on my global config in the TCP configuration to, to associate that with a particular stack. Okay, then I get to the next screen, and here's where that physical network ID, and this, I have um, 
several charts when we get to all the monitoring where we talk about the physical network ID. So it, it'll if you don't catch on right now, you'll you'll get a good feel for how this works, how it works with the OSAs that these are associated with, and things like that. So. Uh, for now, just see that this is where that option for the Rocky Express card would be defined. So here I'm calling it Network 1. So I'm defining this particular Rocky Express to Physical Network 1, and I would also have an OSA that I define in HCD, and I would give it the same network, Network 1. Later, when I start that OSA, when the stack starts up and, and starts that OSA, it looks and says, give me all the RNICs, all the, the Rocky Express adapters that were defined, for that same network as this OSA. And then it sort of associates them together, starts the RNIC cards for you, and you're good to go without any extra uh, Rocky Express configuration in the stack. So you, the other thing to note here is you see there's four slots for the physical network ID. The Rocky Express card itself has two ports. These slots align with the ports on the card. So if I was going to, and we'll get to this again in the TCP configuration, you can define your Rocky Express card to use either port 1 or port 2, one or the other. Based on which port you define, you would, you would identify the network ID on either network ID 1 or network ID 2. And you can see from the red hexagon shape there that the first slot associates with port 1, the second slot associates with port 2. And again, you would choose one or the other for this particular Rocky Express card. And I also point out in the blue box that that network one that you chose there associates this with the same OSI interface for that same physical network. All right, so that's it for the hardware configuration definition. Now I'll take you through the TCP IP configuration. Now note on this chart here, I only have one thing in red. That's the only required TCP IP configuration for this. The other ones are optional, and we'll cover all of them. Uh, but they are not required. The, the, the global config is the only thing you have to configure for the Rocky Express for SMCR. So we'll start off with that. This is the required configuration. You've got most likely an existing global config for your TCP stacks. New keyword SMCR. The default is no SMCR, so if you do nothing, you, get, you don't get SMCR. If you code SMCR and you're going to use it, <clears throat> you need to configure at least one PFID. So here's where that PFID ID goes back to the previous HCD definition where I defined those eight PFIDs on the left hand side. That same number here is where I would, I would configure that for the TCP IP stack. We default to port number one, but again you can use port one or port two, one or the other, but not both for the, for the, for the same PFID. Optional parameters, fixed memory, uh, the default to be 256 meg, um, but you can go up to as high as, I believe it's 9999 meg. Um, that's the storage that is reserved for those buffers I mentioned before, the fixed uh, RMB buffers that are registered for the other stack to use. It's also used for outbound when we, we put the data in a sort of what we call a staging buffer uh, as we, we move it to do a write to the other side. So the memory is used for that as well. Because this is fixed storage, we allow you to cap that so that you can say, I don't want to ever use more than 256 megabytes. If your SMC and you're running and you've got a lot of connections and you start to approach that limit, the only thing that will happen is your connections will still work except that they'll stay on the TCP network. They won't use the SMC network if you, if you approach that limit. The TCP keep min interval we'll talk about later as well has to do with the keep alive interval or keep alive probes that you may have configured for your TCP connection. There's some special considerations with that since the TCP connection sort of is idle for the entire life of this application connection. We have a new option that lets you uh, manage that. and We'll talk about that in detail later. Now you can see at the bottom that um, with these definitions we generate your uh, interface statements and we generate your TRLE for these devices and we build them dynamically. You don't, you don't specify the names. You can see that uh, we use the port number and the PFID to generate the ARNIC interface and the TRLE for these ARNIC devices so that when you do displays later on, you can identify them. All right, uh, dynamically switching to use SMCR or to disable SMCR. You can use Vario Bay profiles. If you've enabled SMCR, 
and decide that you want to stop using it for whatever reason, you can configure VariobeA with no SMCR. And what that'll do is sort of a graceful transition. It just says any new TCP connections, I don't want to use SMC. Use the uh, normal TCP connection uh, protocol. But it won't affect any SMC uh, TCP connections that you currently have established over SMC links. None of the application traffic or anything else will be affected. Those will continue to be used until they naturally terminate and then will fall back to TCP only at that point. Then if you decide to re-enable SMCR, you can do a VariobeA uh, again. And same sort of thing, any TCP connections that were already established over the TCP network are unaffected. They don't then transition to SMCR but all your new TCP connections will be eligible to use SMCR at that point. Any previous settings that you had, uh, unless you have respecified them, will be carried over as well. All right, so if you decide to modify any of your ARNIC or your Rocky Express adapters, you want to modify the PFID. Say you went through that panel before that I showed you with the HCD and I've added a new Rocky Express card. The global config parameter is a full replacement of those PFID values. So any of them that you want to continue using, you must include on any subsequent VariobeA profiles that specify the global config SMCR statement. So if you added a new one, let's say you already had eight of them up, and you added a ninth, and you did the VariobeA with the ninth one in the list, it will automatically be started, assuming you've already previously started an OSA device that was SMCR capable because that's what sort of kicks off the activation of all of the RNICs, is one SMCR-capable OSA. If you wanted to remove a Rocky Express card, say for maintenance or something, you would first stop that RNIC, manually stop the device, then you would remove it from your global config statement, and then issue the VariobeA with the global config with that device removed. And that will remove the RNIC from the uh, configuration. All right, the fixed memory, the optional parameter. Again, this is the maximum amount of that fixed 64-bit storage that TCP will use for SMCR processing. It mostly comprises of the R and B storage, that's the, the buffers that are registered for the other side to use to write into, and it's used for the staging buffer, the outbound data that we send from the application. The range is from 30 to the 9,999 megabytes, the default is 256, which is we found to be a, a pretty sufficient number for a pretty heavy uh, workload. However, you can change it with a VariobeA profile. If you specify the SMCR, say you're adding that ninth RNIC or that ninth Rocky Express, and you don't respecify fixed memory, that's okay. We just take the last limit that you had. We don't require you to respecify that every time. And if you decide that that limit was too high and you lower it, Long term, it will, it will be uh, used and uh, taken into account. However, it won't impact any current TCP connections over your SMC links. If you're currently near the limit and you lower that limit significantly, we're not going to tear down any TCP connections to satisfy that new limit. They'll just be terminated naturally and we'll fall back to the smaller limit. We have a little worksheet here uh, that we use to uh, suggest the size of the fixed memory. If you didn't want to use our default of 256 megabytes or you're concerned that that wasn't the right number, you can sort of use this as a general guideline of, uh, for your configuration. In this case, um, we have two Rocky Express cards on the same physical network. This is for one stack, from one stack's perspective. I've got two Rocky Express cards defined in my stack. I expect I'll have 12 SMCR link groups. We'll talk about what an SMC link group is in a little bit. But I expect I'll have 12 of those, and that's essentially 12 different SMC connections to different peers. And that's, that's because I've got three different VLANs and four peers per VLAN. So four peers, and we're going to go over three different VLANs. Different VLANs require unique SMCR links, and so that's why I've got the 12 total. So based on that, I said I'll need about 8 meg for my staging buffer. That's the outbound data that's used to write directly to the remote side. When the stack comes up SMCR enabled, we already get 4 meg as a default. So the 8 was sort of a, a, a fudge factor to allow for heavy workload. And we dynamically grow it. You don't have to do anything to get that. We dynamically will expand our staging buffers from 4 meg upward as necessary. So we used 8 meg for this configuration. We estimate about 2 megabytes of this data will be needed for the Rocky Express cards themselves. Each card requires about a meg each. 
We're going to have 12 RMBs because we're supporting 12 different SMC link connections. Each RMB, each SMC link connection, uh, we're going to say has three megabytes of RMB storage. So that gives us 36 meg. The overall TCP workload, we sort of have a rough estimate that says divide by eight the number of TCP connections using SMC, and then multiply that by one meg, and that gives you a rough idea of how much expansion you need to account for. The RMBs, we might need more of them. We might need more staging buffers. So that gives us 28 meg for a total of 74 meg. So for this workload, I probably could get away with 75 to 100 megabytes if I wanted to, if I didn't want to use uh, 256 total. Now, this is an estimation only. There, later, we'll see a display TCP store command that shows you actually your usage. So if you've got workloads up and using SMC, you can see the high watermarks and use that as a better predictor for future workloads. Okay, I mentioned the keep alive uh, on the global config, and this is, this is where that comes into play. Um, keep in mind, remember that all the data passed back and forth between the applications using SMC, it flows what we call out of band. It doesn't flow across the TCP connection. We maintain that TCP connection, though, across the life of the entire connection. So that connection now looks idle, right? That TCP connection doesn't have anything flowing over it, so it can, can appear idle to anybody that's monitoring it for, uh, from a Keep Alive perspective. And I re-show re the picture there. That kind of gives you that idea there with the TCP connection idle in the middle. <clears throat> there might be cases where you have somebody in the middle of your two peers monitoring data traffic to indicate that a connection is still healthy. And so as long as something flows across the TCP connection now and then, everything's fine, no worries. And, but if their period of time expires and they don't see any traffic across the TCP connection, they may think it's, it's just been a dead connection that was never cleaned up, so they may issue a, a reset and, and terminate that connection. So TCP uses this Keep Alive protocol that an application can set, and you can do it on a per-application basis, that periodically will send a packet over a TCP connection that's been otherwise idle. And that sort of goes and asks the other side, hey, are you still around? And he'll respond, and we say, okay, yeah, I'm still around, and the connection's fine. It's just there's no data for a while over it. The application indicates that it wants to use Keep Alive for this particular connection by specifying the SO Keep Alive set sock option. And then once it specifies that, there's two, two ways we can determine how long we'll wait before we send that packet across the TCP connection. There's the TCP Keep Alive set sock op, so the same application can issue, I want to use Keep Alive, and here's the interval I want to use. And that'll override any TCP stack-wide configuration interval that you might have coded. So you can, co you can code a TCP one with the TCP config interval option. That'll apply to anybody who's using Keep Alive, and then the individual apps can override that with the TCP Keep Alive set sock op. So you might have an application that up till today has been using TCP connections and it does have Keep Alive defined. And you might have a relatively low value for that. And that's sort of the, the connection that we're going after with this solution here. So we came up with a new value that's configured on the global config SMCR statement. TCP Keep Min Interval. Gives you a, the ability to define in seconds the minimum interval that will send those TCP Keep Alive packets across the TCP connection. So in other words, if you didn't do anything and your application was saying every five minutes I want to send a Keep Alive probe to my peer if there's no data traffic, and now you switch to using SMC and that connection now flows over SMC, since that connection is going to always look idle, that means every five minutes you're going to send a Keep Alive probe over the TCP connection. And that burns resources and CPU cycles and things like that. So this new option allows you to say, I understand I'm going to use SMC for this connection. I want a much higher value for the TCP Keep Alive protocol. And so we allow you to go up as high as, as you can see the value there in seconds. Zero means I don't want any TCP Keep Alive packets sent. For this SMCR connection, I don't have to worry about anybody resetting it. I'm going to use zero. I don't want to send TCP probes anymore. We default to five minutes. So you can obviously raise that if you want. You can change it with a variable profile and it'll affect future connections. It won't affect the current connections. But it gives you a way to say, 
I may not want to send a probe but every 30 minutes across the TCP connection, but still use keep alive across your SMC connection, because that's really where the connection's at now, right? The data's flowing over SMC. So I really want to use a keep alive type processing, but I want to use it across the SMC connection. I want to make sure both sides are still active there. So your, your regular keep alive that you had to find is say five minutes, that'll still be used for the SMC connection, and you can override the TCP1 so that we don't send a probe but every 30 minutes across the TCP connection. So a simple example here, assume my application coded a keep alive value, so he wants to use keep alive, and he set it at five minutes. The TCP stack has the interval set to 10 minutes, and I've coded the new global config TCP keep alive interval to 25 minutes. In other words, I don't want to send a TCP probe but every 25 minutes. So for all your TCP connections that use SMCR, we'll now send a probe across the TCP connection every 25 minutes instead of every five minutes, but we'll use the five minutes that the application specified for my SMCR link. For all my TCP connections that don't use SMCR, nothing's changed, I still use the five minute link. Hopefully for most of you this won't be an issue, you don't use Keep Alive and this is not, not an impact, but, but in case you do, this is a way that you can sort of reduce that churn of generating unnecessary TCP Keep Alive probes. All right, now remember my initial chart showed you in red what was required. That's the global config configuration. All of the rest of these configurations I'm going to show you are optional. <clears throat> this is the OSA definition for an OSD device. And by default, we say that it's SMC enabled. Now, why do we do that? Because, I'm sorry. We do that because unless you've coded global config SMCR, this means nothing. The SMCR definition on the OSA means nothing unless I've said I want to use SMCR in my global config. So we enable it by default here. You can optionally specify a VLAN ID, but you don't have to. You can, you can have all these defined with no VLAN ID. <clears throat> Keep in mind, if you do though, all of the OSAs on all of the stacks using that associated Rocky Express card would also have to not use VLANs. You can't have a mix of VLANs and no VLANs for the same Rocky card. So that's something to keep in mind. And I have something summary later that, that reminds you of that. You also must have a non-zero subnet for your uh, OSA that is going to use SMCR. So if I did nothing here and I had a, I had a uh, subnet defined, I would, I would have an SMCR-enabled OSA device without having to change any configuration. Now, this is the OSA that once the stack starts up, starts this particular OSA, because it's SMCR enabled, any Rocky Express adapters that I've defined for this stack, they would all get activated at this point. Even if they're not necessarily associated with this OSA, the fact that this OSA is SMCR enabled would cause them all to be started and become available for use. All right, another optional parameter that's, um, that can be useful depending on your workload is for the port or the port range statement. Now, SMCR provides significant reduction in latency for almost every type of workload. But there are some workloads that because they're so short-lived, that time we spend setting up the connection over SMCR can overwhelm the data flow that we do. It might be a very short Send, send one request, get one reply, terminate the connection. <clears throat> that may not be the best workload for SMCR, so the way you can control that is with a port statement saying, anybody connecting to this particular port, anybody using this server, I don't want to use SMCR. So even if the client comes in asking to use SMCR, I've defined this port to say no SMCR, I'm not going to respond in favor of using SMCR, and we'll use TCP for that connection. So it's a way to allow you, from a server's point of view, to, to stick with TCP and not use SMC. And I give you down in the blue box why you might do that for short-lived connections. All right, so now some of the monitoring that you can do. You've, you've defined all these uh, Rocky Express cards. You've started up your stack. You think you got everything going. And you want to see if things are the way you expect. So the first def uh, display that I show is a PCIe definite uh, display. And the first box shows you the status before I've started a, a SMCR enabled OSA device. So remember on the OSA definition, by default, they're SMC enabled. 
But if I haven't started any OSA devices yet that are SMC enabled, I would see the following display. I'd have two Rocky Express cards that are in config status, which means they're defined in my stack, but they've not been activated yet. The other one is in standby, meaning it was it's available in the LPAR, but it wasn't defined to my stack, to my LPAR. It's available to the, to the CAC, but it's not defined to my LPAR. I could vary it online if I want later, but the ones I have right now are in config status. Then look at the bottom of the first yellow box. You can see that I vary obey start an OSA device, OSD1. That's an SMCR-enabled OSA. It successfully starts. And because of that, notice that I now get two initialization completes for uh, the Rocky Express interfaces, the EZA RIUT devices. Those were started automatically because the OSA started. You don't have to explicitly start them. Now the same display, DC PCIe, after I've started them, shows that those two Rockies that were in config status are now allocated and ready for use. So that's a way to confirm that you've got your Rocky cards defined and activated. You can also look at some Rocky statistics. Once you start using workload, you can display TRLE for that Rocky device, and you can see some statistics that show activity over that Rocky Express adapter. The dev stats is a new uh, keyword and only valid for the Rocky devices. And you know, quickly you can see that, oh, I've got inbound, a, a lot of uh, bytes have come in, and outbound I've had a lot of bytes. So I'm clearly using this Rocky Express adapter card for data, which is good. That's what I would expect to see. This is kind of lower layer hardware displays. You'll see some TCP more familiar NetStat displays coming up. Here are the NetStat changes that we did. And as I mentioned, not a lot to configure, but we do have a lot that allows you to monitor what's happening. One of the main ones is the NetStat All display. That gives you kind of that detailed look at TCP connections. Now that same display will show you SMCR information about the TCP connection when you are using SMCR for that connection. If the TCP connection was established over SMCR, we now show you the SMC link ID and the link group information. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about the group in a bit. But if it doesn't use SMCR, for some reason, I've defined my stack, I've got my Rocky Express adapters, everything's good to go, but for some reason, this TCP connection did not use SMCR. It fell back to use TCP. It's still an active connection, but it's going to use TCP, not SMCR. If that's the case, I still show you um, a display on the Nets at all that tells you the reason why we didn't use SMCR. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. All of our connection reports, the NetStat Con, NetStat All Con, and NetStat All, support a new filter that says, I only want to see the connections that are using SMC. And that's the SMC ID filter. And I can specify a specific link ID or link group that says, show me all the TCP connections that are using this particular SMC link. So it helps you filter out all that traffic. You can also say, I just want to see all the SMC connections, and I can use an asterisk for that filter to, to achieve that. So here's an example of the NetStat All output. I've taken a snippet of the, you know, as you know, this is a detailed display for the connection. But I've included just the part that shows you the new SMC information. So this is a particular connection um, that shows you at the top the local uh, IP address, the foreign IP address, the ports that we're using. It looks like it's an FTP connection. And then I've got this SMC information in blue there. The status is active. That means this TCP connection is exchanging data across an SMC link. I give you the SMC group ID and the SMC local link ID. Now notice the similarities between those two values. The group ID is sort of the base for all the SMC links within this group. So for my local link, it's based on that group ID and I simply append a one to the end of it. If I had two SMC links in this group, I would see a two there. I also get the remote SMC link ID. It's not based on my group ID, it's based on the remote side's group ID that represents the same group. We're talking about the same SMC link, it's just that we have our own representation of it. The reason I show that value here is if I wanted to know information about this link on the other stack or on my peer, I can take this remote SMC link ID and go search over there and find it and find the matching connection or the matching link. We also include, um, for this particular connection, what size RMB buffer, 
Recall that first picture I showed where when you establish an SMC connection, we register that data that the other side writes data into. That's called the RMB. This is the size of the RMB slot that I got for this connection. It's 64K. That's loosely based on the TCP receive buffer size for this connection. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But in general, that tells me that this is not a huge connection. This wasn't a large uh, receive buffer that I used, 64K. We can go as high as 1 meg for our RMB sizes to give you an indication of what that value can expand to. It also tells me that the remote side is using a 64K. So we're, we're probably talking about a small uh, data pattern here back and forth. If I was streaming a large amount of data to the remote side, I might expect to see a much larger remote SMC receive buffer there. But it helps you understand how much storage you're using for this connection of that fixed storage. Now here's a case where I started my TCP connection and I could not use SMCR for this TCP connection. In the first case there, I show you the status is inactive, inactive, and the reason is uh, a locally defined reason code. In other words, this is my stack telling me we couldn't use SMCR and here's why. In this case, I sent the request to the remote side during that exchange in the beginning to the TCP connection setup, and the other side did not respond favorably. He said he didn't want to use SMCR. I don't know why, he just said he didn't want to use it. So I tell you that we tried to use it. We were eligible on our stack. Maybe the other side did not have any Rocky Express cards defined or active or something. So he didn't accept our request. The second case is <clears throat> we were going to use SMCR, but the other side, for whatever reason, decided not to use it, and he sent me his reason code, and since I don't know necessarily eventually which platform this came from, right now it's, it's going to be a ZOS, but down the road it might be a different platform, I'm just going to display whatever reason code he gave me, and I'm going to say, the peer generated this response. Go to that platform and figure out what that reason code means. So that's two different types of reasons we wouldn't use SMCR for this TCP connection. It's important to understand them because you'd want to know which stack to investigate why you might not be using it. Now, I do want to point out that once you enable SMCR on your stack, you've defined the global config with SMCR, technically all subsequent TCP connections are eligible to use SMCR. So you're going to see this display for all those TCP connections, even if they're not using SMC. So keep in mind you'll see probably a lot of SMC status inactive for all your TCP connections once you enable SMCR. All right, some of the other information in the nets.all, this is the existing fields. These are not new, but for reporting or for chargebacks and things like that, we still show you the bytes in, the bytes out. We show you segments in and segments out for this TCP connection. Even if this connection is going over an SMC link, you can still track and monitor how many bytes were sent, how many bytes received, how many times we wrote, and how many times we received data. That's the segments in and segments out. So all of that statistical information is still maintained for your SMC connections. The other fields there are related to the TCP aspect of this connection. Remember, there's a TCP connection, SMC connection. Those other fields relate to the TCP part. You can track what you configured in your TCP IP profile with the NetStack config. And here we show you that you indeed did code SMCR yes. You did override the default fixed memory. Here you chose 200 megabytes. Um, you left the default TCP keep min interval at 300 seconds. And you defined two Rocky Express cards, your two PFIDs there, one Charlie and one five. And you actually used two different ports. In the first card, you used port number one. The second card, you overrode the default and used port number two. So this is a case where I've got two Rocky Express, which is the minimum recommended amount uh, for redundancy. On the NetSat DevLinks display, I'm first showing you the, the existing OSA. So I've got an OSA that was defined. It was SMCR enabled, or the default. So I see SMCR, yes, there. That's a new display. Here's that new PNet ID. Remember I talked about, we're going to talk about the PNet ID many times. Back in the early part of the presentation, I defined something as Network 1. Well, here I've defined the PNet, the network ID, as ZOSNet. So this OSA was defined with ZOSNet PNAT ID, and that means any Rocky Express cards that were defined with that same network ID, ZOSNet, are associated with this OSA. 
they were activated and associated with this OSA. So that means any connection I send out over this OSA, if I, they're going to try to use those two SMCR NICs for the SMCR link connection. That's how they're associated. I also show you that for non-OSD devices that are not SMCR devices, for instance, in this case an OSX device, we still require the PNET ID and it defaults to IEDN for this case because it's an OSX device. So I just want to point that out there. <clears throat> Does not work with RNICs. You can see there's no associated RNICs for that device. Now you can add a new modifier to the Netstat Dev Links display called SMC. In this case, I just want to see all the things associated with my Rocky Express adapters and any SMC links that I've created. So the first part of the display is an SM, a Rocky Express adapter. That's the EZA RIUT1, meaning port 1, 1 Charlie, which is the, uh, the PFID for this RNIC. And you can see some of the information that I display there. Again, there's the PNET ID, ZOSNet, that matches that OSD PNET ID. Some of the uh, sort of um, technical aspects of the uh, Rocky Express, like the VMAC adder, um, uh, sort of a virtual get address. But then the more interesting thing is when I get to the interface statistics. So this is, for this Rocky Express card, the interface statistics, I've received 160 bytes, I've sent 344, gives you the number of operations in and out. How many SMC links have I established over this Rocky Express card? In this case, just one. And I tell you how many TCP connections flow over this Rocky Express card. Here again, I've got one TCP connection. For this TCP connection, I'm using a 64K remote memory buffer. That's that remote memory buffer size that I talked about earlier. Now in blue here, I show you the actual SMC link that I've created that connects the two peers. I give you the information about the link itself. This is some of the stuff that we saw earlier in the Netstat All, like the link ID, the group ID. <clears throat> I give you the information about my remote side. It's half of the link. The amount of data that's transferred across this link. And at the bottom, I give you the link buffer size, again, is 64K. So if I had several connections going over this link, I might use different receive buffer sizes. I might have 64K for one connection. I might have 256K for another connection because it's transferring larger amounts of data. That would show up in this connection. And the reason we show you on the nest at all what size your connection uses is if there were multiple connections here, you couldn't tell which connections are using which size buffers. At the bottom of the NetStat uh, device with SMC, it would give you sort of the link summary group information. So the links, you get the two equal links for backup and redundancy, and they become a link group. And this is the link group telling you that, yes, you had two SMC links in this link group. This is the thing that's really good about this one is my redundancy is full. That's what I want. That means I've got back, you know, kind of takeover capabilities. I'm able to load balance across two different links. Remember, these two links are otherwise equal. I, I believe Jerry talked about this in the last quarter. There are connections to the same peers. They share the same RMB buffers. You write data to the same buffers. One can take over for the other if there's a problem with that particular link. And so that's why we list them here. The total number of fixed buffer size that I'm using for this link, for this link group, is 3 meg. Remember, that's the default size that we obtain for every link group. So in this case, I have full redundancy. And we'll talk a little bit about redundancy now. Redundancy is very important uh, because it allows you to do the load balancing across the two links, spread your workload out, and also allows you to do some recovery. <clears throat> Whenever we have a new TCP connection, we're going to give it to the SMC link. Remember the previous foil where I show two links comprise the link group. So I'm going to give a new TCP connection to the, one, to the link in that group that has the least number of connections. But I'm only going to do that if I've got multiple RNICs on each side. I've got to have that, that nice full redundancy. So the full redundancy requires that you have at least two or more Rocky Express adapters at each pier. You follow the installation guidelines to ensure that each of those adapters has a unique system internal path. One of the key aspects of that is that the Rocky Express adapter I.O. drawer, when you plug these cards in, you plug one on the left side and one on the right side. And that's important to really achieve that full redundancy. If you plug both cards in, say for instance on the left side, we're not going to report full redundancy. And you lose some of that load balancing uh, that we talked about earlier. You also have unique physical Rocky switches. 
is sort of common sense. You, don't, you want to eliminate all single points of failure. You don't want the switch or one card or any of the internal stuff to be your one source of failure. You can still achieve partial redundancy if you don't have all of these things. And there's some pictures I'll show in a minute where you might have partial redundancy that can even support uh, recovery. Not load balancing, but recovery. And I'll show you a picture of that. So here's the, here's the optimal case where you've got full redundancy. I've got two Rockies on each side. I've got two switches. I've got two complete independent links across between the two. Notice on the endpoints in the purple boxes, the yellow RMBs, they're shared by those two SMC links. They share the RMB buffers. And if one of these links goes bad, if PFID A, say, goes out, all the traffic that goes across SMCR link 1 will fail over to link 2 without interruption and still use those same RMBs. So that's the optimal case. Here's a case where one side of the SMC link had the two Rocky Express adapters, but the other side only had one. So we still created uh, two links from between the two peers, and I can still achieve failover. However, in this case, I will not load balance between the two links. I'll use SMCR link primarily for all connections, and only if something fails on PFID A, I could fail over to the second link. Obviously, if PFID C fails, I'm out of luck. There's no backup, there's no recovery possible. So this would be workable, but not recommended. All right, some uh, other uh, SMCR monitoring that we can do are enhancements to our NetStat stats. This is an existing NetStat display. Uh, we show TCP statistics, and I've sort of uh, shortened that part at the top. But after the TCP statistics, you'll get a new display of SMCR statistics. The things in blue are unique to SMC connections or SMC links. The things in red are subsets of the TCP statistics. So it gives you an idea if I've got 100 TCP connections up, 50 of them are going over SMC, then the red is that subset, those 50 connections out of that 100. That represents that amount of data. The blue is unique. So in other words, I've got two SMC links for the stack. Um, they were opened passively, meaning I'm probably the server and the client's on the remote side asking me to open the links up. And then in red, I've got two TCP connections. I've received eight segments. I've sent 284, um, and I've got uh, no resets or anything else. So it just gives you a, a general overview of, of activity across the SMC link, a very easy way to see, am I using SMC for these TCP connections? This display would confirm that you are. Now, I mentioned the display store command earlier when talking about how much fixed memory you might want to use. Here's where, after I've run workload over SMC for a period of time, I can go do the display store command, and I've got some new fields that will help me determine how much of that fixed memory am I using. In this case, you can see I defined 256 meg as my limit. That doesn't mean I, I went out and fixed 256 meg of storage. It just means that's how high I can go to. That's how much I can fix. But in this case, I only hit a high water mark of 11 meg, so I'm not using very much. This is a very light workload uh, SMCR system. I used 4 meg of staging buffer, and as I mentioned earlier, that's the default, so the stack never expanded beyond that, and 3 meg for my RMBs, which is the default you get for an SMC link. The other, the other part of it where you can see the 11 minus the 7 that we have there is for, for SMC control blocks and for the Rocky Express cards. So that would be a real indication of how much of that fixed memory you're really using. All right, some VTAM commands that you can issue that will tell you a little bit more about the devices. Uh, you, can, you can show all the, the TRLEs that are using um, our NIC interfaces with the control equal Rocky keyword. So in this case, I've got my two TRLEs representing two RNIC Rocky Express cards, and they're Rocky cards. I can see that here, and then I can grab those TRLEs and use them for further displays. So on the next page, I've, I've now expanded that, and I said, give me detailed information for this particular Rocky adapter card. And one of the things that's interesting in here is it'll tell you how many stacks are using that particular Rocky Express card. Remember, you can have multiple stacks share a Rocky card on the same LPAR. In this case, I've got two stacks sharing that Rocky card, TCP 1 and 2. Again, in the top circle there, the PNET ID is shown. That's a common theme. You see that, that displayed almost on every one of our displays. 
this is the OSA adapter. So this is an existing display for an OSA adapter, but now this OSA adapter has the new PNET value that is required for your OSAs. And here again, I've got the PNET ID ZOSNET. That way I can tie these to the associated Rocky cards. I've got tune stat changes um, that I can get with the TRLE uh, for the Rocky Express. And it'll give me the Rocky Express wide statistics. Uh, and you can see for this case, I'm looking at the statistics for TCP CS1. Remember, this card was shared by a couple stacks. This is for stack one. And in here, I can see how many bytes I received inbound over the Rocky Express card. That's the in byte in, n. And how many requests I got from the TCP stack for this TCP stack to send data outbound to my peer. And there's a lot of other stats in there. But it gives you a feel for if you had a couple of stacks using the same Rocky card, you could look at this display and see which stack is exploiting it differently and how much data is being transferred back and forth per stack. So that's a pretty useful display. All right. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the SMF enhancements. I mentioned earlier that uh, the NMI enhancements are discussed in the appendix uh, that's attached to this presentation. But I will cover some of the SMF ones because those are used a lot by a lot of our customers for um, uh, reporting and for uh, tracking. We added support to many existing SMF 119 records, the, the 2, 4, 5, and 6 types. So for the TCP termination record, we will tell you about the capability of the TCP connection. If the connection supports using SMC, meaning that status was active, you'll see that with this record. For the TCP IP profile subtype 4, well, we report the SMCR configuration settings. So that's where you'll see your global config settings. The statistics that we just talked about are reported with subtype 5. You'll see the TCP statistics, then you'll see them followed by the SMCR statistics. And then you can also see um, OSA interface statistics, which already exists, but we now add that PNET ID is displayed, and you'll also see if it's SMCR able. Now, for Rocky interfaces, we have a new subtype called 44. You, you get the 44 records with the same SMF configuration as you do the subtype 6, but it creates a new subtype if it's a Rocky device, and we'll see some details on that in a minute. We have two new SMF options for Rocky that are shown here. Uh, one of them subtype 41, which is the group statistics. That gives you all the information, kind of like that NetStat device display with SMC, all the information about your SMC links and the link groups. So you want to kind of see all that in one place. How many links did I create? How many link groups did I use? How much of that RMB storage am I using? That can be shown with this SMC uh, report. And the subtype 42 and 43, which are your link events, if you wanted to see links coming up and down, which you wouldn't expect to happen uh, during a steady state, but you might want to track that. You can see that with this, with this report now, and now generate the subtype 42 and 43s. The 44, that new record I talked about, you turn that on with the existing IF statistics display, so it's not a new option to configure, but it's a new record that will be generated for every Rocky Express card that you have. So it'll give you the SMC link and the TCP connection statistics, Give you, of course, that PNET ID that allows you to correlate it with, with OSA. Uh, it'll tell you if we've ever stopped um, or started the stack and give you a closeout record. Um, but if you just stop the ARNIC interface, you don't get the closeout record. For diagnostics, um, pretty much it's similar to everything we have for TCP. The, the one interesting twist is since we don't create packets now, that's one of the advantages, one of the reasons there's such low latency for SMC is we don't packetize everything. We don't create all these headers and do all the packetizing that TCP does. But we still needed to be able to trace that for problem diagnosis with our packet trace. So we did, we did add functionality to the packet trace. You enable the same way as you do for TCP connections. You can do it on protocol basis. You can, you can say I want to packet trace by port or by IP address. All those things are still valid for SMC connections because you're still talking about a TCP connection associated with that SMC connection. And if you do that, we'll show you all the application traffic between the two peers for this SMC connection. We'll also show you some of the uh, messages that are exchanged when we're setting up the connection. I talked about the rendezvous process that happens at the beginning of the TCP connection when the SMC link is decided to be used. That's the CLC messages. And then as we flow messages back and forth about the actual 
Uh, SMC links themselves, they're kind of low layer or link layer messages. We display those as well with packet trace. We also have full support for our, our C trace, our data trace, our VIT, all that stuff uh, is, is fully supported uh, as it is for TCP connections with, with no additional configuration. Here's just some quick examples of what the packet trace looks like for some of these new messages. So in this case, I'm showing the first message I'm sending across the TCP connection after we've agreed to use SMC. So this is that first of the three-way follow-up handshake to establish uh, an SMC link for this TCP connection. We call this a proposal message. So you can see that I give you the message type. Uh, it's an SMCR type message. Uh, I give you the IP header and the protocol header, the TCP part, and we, we're basically exchanging information from the client to the server to say, here's my half of the SMC link, and then the server will get that, and he'll respond with an accept message and say, okay, here's my half, let's go ahead and use an SMC link. But you can follow all that through the packet trace and see how everything's set up. Once the connection is set up and it's using SMC, it, it goes to out of band, and now the data flows over the SMC link. Here's what something like that would look like when we actually exchange data over the SMC link. So with packet trace, you can still see that kind of information. We give you, it, it, the format's a little bit different, but it's pretty easy to follow. You can see at the top, we tell you that this is an outbound packet, just like we do for TCP. And we give you a little keyword SMC to give you a, a real simple identification that this is an SMC packet going over an SMC link. And then we tell you the payload, just like we do for TCP. I, I'm sending 22 bytes. A lot of the details about the connection itself, stuff that you would see on the network device display, or the NetStat device display. But that's all the connection related stuff. And then at the bottom, I give you the actual data, the 22 bytes of data that's being transferred across this SMC link. So as you can see, very similar to uh, a packet trace for TCP. All right, so a quick summary of everything we talked about. If you know you're going to have short-lived connections and you're enabling SMCR, you might want to consider the no SMCR option for servers supporting short-lived connections. Uh, you might want to consider using a larger TCP receive buffer size if you know you're going to be receiving large amounts of data across the SMC link, streaming or bulk type connections. Use at least two raw RNIC adapters or Rocky Express adapters per peer, per physical network so that you get that reliable uh, connectivity, you've got the failover, and you get the load balancing. Uh, the combination of the PFID that you define for the Rocky Express adapter and the port number that you define on the global config uh, defines a given RNIC adapter. You can use port number one or two of the two ports, but not both. Remember, you can't use both ports. The client server must be in the same physical network and use the same VLAN if you're using the optional VLAN ID. Uh, the SMCR-enabled OSA interfaces must have non-zero subnets for IPv4 or non-zero prefixes for IPv6. And then we recommend that you use that display TCP IP store command with the new display showing how much fixed storage you're actually using. I think that's it. The rest is the appendix for the NMI if anybody's interested.